Hi, my name is Gary Frenette. We're very excited today to offer you a five-point video series on nutritional management. These five lectures include such things as making wise food choices and also approach the emotional aspects and behavioral aspects of eating, which is a very important point in nutritional management. This is the way we envision this program working. We're going to work with you to set certain objectives based on your needs. These could include weight loss, but may simply include making better food choices. What we'll do then is make certain objective goals for ourselves that we can therefore thereafter measure. And then once a month, we're going to ask you to keep a food diary during this time and once a month report back to us either by email or phone or even by postal mail how you're doing with regard to your stated goals. If you're doing well, we'll simply continue on and if you're having trouble with your objectives, we'll probably have you come in or contact you in some way so that we can discuss those challenges and overcome them. Nutritional management is such an important point of cancer care, and post-cancer management. We know that diet can have a profound effect on your overall health, as well as potentially the risk for cancer recurrence. So we're going to make this strong effort with you to try to help you make the very best choices possible. We're quite excited about initiating this program, and I think you will be too after you review the following videos. There must be a ton of weight loss diets out there. If they all result in weight loss in the end, does it really matter which one you follow? I bet you've heard of a lot of various ones that worked for people. Maybe the all meat diet, or the cabbage only diet, or the one where you replace meals with artificially flavored, vitamin fortified chocolate shakes. Well, research suggests that nutrition really does matter. A healthy diet is always important. Hello, my name is Jennifer. I'm a registered dietitian. In this presentation, you'll learn why nutrition really does matter in health and wellness. The choices we make impact our health. Researchers who study cancer incidence and risk have noticed that some choices we make have significant influence. Some of these choices include what we weigh, what we eat most of the time, whether or not we exercise or are physically active, whether we smoke or use tobacco products, and to the extent that we can choose, our environment plays an important role. While there are no guarantees, our everyday choices can either raise or lower the risk of cancer. We'll be focusing on what we can do from a diet and weight perspective to lower risk. Diet choices influence cancer risk both directly and indirectly. Eating more than we need on a regular basis can result in excess body weight, and this is a cancer risk all by itself. But diet is also directly involved in health because it can be a source of carcinogens, or cancer-causing compounds, or it could supply things that help our body get rid of those dangerous things. Our diet also provides nutrients needed for normal cellular activity and contains a variety of things we call bioactives because they're actively involved in our body's processes. They may serve as antioxidants, they could sway inflammation, or they can even impact our immune systems. To lower the risk of several types of cancer, you want to achieve and maintain a healthy BMI. The BMI, or body mass index, is a calculation based on your height and weight. Therefore, it can be imperfect since muscle does weigh more than fat. But studies show that BMI is a pretty reliable indicator of risk for most people, and so it's wise to stay within the healthy range, unless you know you're a bodybuilder. Do you know what your BMI is? If not, there are many different ways to find out. If you have access to the computer, it's super easy. With a simple online search, you can find free calculators. If you don't have a computer, simply ask a nurse or doctor at your next visit. 
One of the first diet strategies to lower cancer risk is to simply minimize the things we know that cause cancer, such as the heterocyclic amines in burned meats, or nitrosamines that form when we eat preserved meats, or aflatoxins in moldy grains or peanuts. To minimize cancer-causing agents in your diet, avoid burning meat. If you like to use the grill, use marinades and keep the meat a distance from the flame. You want it to cook slower and at a lower temperature, not like this guy's doing in the picture. Eat no more than 18 ounces of red meat per week. And it's probably better to avoid processed meats altogether. Processed meats are preserved by salting, curing, smoking, or adding preservatives such as nitrates. Examples are hot dogs, ham, and even deli meats. Researchers are still unsure what level of intake is safe. In some cases, intake as low as 1.2 ounces per day was shown to be harmful. This doesn't even make a decent sandwich. Other risky diet habits include excessive intake of alcohol. Women, you'll want to keep your intake to one serving or less per day. Men, you can have up to two. High intake of saturated fats, simple sugars like cakes, cookies, pies, and sweet treats, and highly salted foods pose a risk in a lot of research studies. Moldy grains and nuts are also a high risk item. Never eat a moldy peanut. It's just not worth the risk. To get the most amount of protection from your diet, get your nutrients from foods, not supplements. A lot of the studies on supplements haven't turned out so well. In some cases, when researchers tried to supplement an individual nutrient, such as vitamin E, selenium, or beta carotene, they discovered that this increased cancer risk rather than decreased it like they'd hoped. Foods are very complex. They may contain hundreds, if not thousands, of protective properties, and we just can't fit that into one little pill. Not only that, but scientists are still discovering new beneficial properties in foods, so we don't even know everything that we need. There may be times that someone will need a supplement, but foods should be used to lower cancer risk rather than supplements. Eat a plant-based diet. You don't have to be vegetarian, but you do want to eat plants and lots of them. Plants contain a variety of compounds. We call these phytochemicals and phytochemicals protect our health in a wide variety of ways. You may have heard that you should eat a rainbow of colors. This is because different plants have different protective properties and many times they seem to be color-coded. Plants which are purple-blue in color, such as purple cabbage, beets, purple plums, or even blueberries, protect our health in a unique way. On the other hand, the green ones, such as spinach, lettuce, and kiwi, protect our health as well, but in a different way. Some phytochemicals seem to be flavor-coded instead of color-coded. For example, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts share a common flavor. And you guessed it, this sulfur-containing compound protects your health in its own unique way. Aim for a variety of plant flavors and colors in your diet. Blue, purple, green, red, orange, yellow, and yes, even white, in order to maximize the variety of phytochemicals you consume. Benefits are found throughout the entire plant, so it's better to eat all edible portions rather than to remove just a fraction. When you take an apple and turn it into juice, you still get some value, but you'll get far more if you eat the unpeeled apple instead. One practical way to apply this is to picture what a food might look like in nature and then choose that version. If you went to an orange tree, you wouldn't find a glass of juice. You'd find an orange. If you were looking at a wheat field, you would notice that it looked golden brown and fibrous, so you want to see evidence of those particles in your piece of bread or other baked good. The exception to this rule is fresh versus frozen. A lot of people tell me that a barrier to eating fruits and vegetables is that they have to frequent the grocery store, wash and peel and chop fresh produce. Frozen produce is just as nutritious as fresh, and in some cases, even more so because the freezing locks nutrients in place. 
There's nothing more convenient than frozen broccoli right out of the freezer into your microwave or cooking pan served onto your plate. Good news, you don't have to be on a bland and flavorless diet to be healthy. In fact, remember, spices come from plants too. Many of them are highly concentrated in phytochemicals and bioactive compounds. It's not surprising since they're also so concentrated in flavor. Spices add flavor without adding salt or calories and even some condiments, such as mustard or pizza sauce, have been found to produce healthful benefits when consumed regularly. Fats and oils play an important role in health. The fats in our meals can help us pick up some vitamins and other nutrients in foods, and they also play an important role in the structure of our cells. But fats and oils are high in calories, and so you want to be careful to eat enough but not too much if you are controlling your weight. And not all fats are created equally. Too much saturated fat may increase risk of things like colon or prostate cancer. And while we likely need some saturated fats in our diet, it may be prudent to use unsaturated sources more frequently. Omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids play a role in inflammation. Chronic systemic inflammation has been blamed in many chronic illnesses, including cancer, heart disease, and even Alzheimer's disease. Omega-6 fatty acids tend to create inflammatory compounds, while omega-3s create anti-inflammatory compounds. We actually need both, but the problem is, the sources of fat in our diet are now primarily omega-6, and our diets have become imbalanced we have to actively seek out sources of omega-3s if we hope to have them in our diet. Cold water fish, such as wild caught salmon, is an excellent source. As you can see, nutrition is really important and it does matter what choices you make. You want to leverage your diet in a way that lowers cancer risk and creates health and wellness, not just weight loss. Keeping the principles we've learned in mind, are you ready for the next step? If so, go to the next presentation in this series entitled, Nutrition Strategies for Weight Control. In the first presentation, Nutrition Matters in Health and Wellness, we learned that weight control is important in lowering the risk of cancer. We also discussed diet recommendations for cancer prevention. Hello, my name is Jennifer. I'm a registered dietitian. In this next presentation, we'll discuss healthy nutrition strategies for weight control. A calorie is a measure of energy, and while no one likes to count them, the truth is they're important. If the number of calories you eat equals the number of calories you use, you maintain weight. This doesn't always add up perfectly every day, but as long as you're in the ballpark most days, you'll maintain weight because this is where your body prefers to stay. If you persistently eat more calories than you use, you gain weight. If you persistently eat fewer than you use, you lose weight. It's basic accounting, but a pound of body fat stores 3,500 calories. That's pretty efficient storage and that's why it feels like it takes so much work to lose. It takes persistence to use this amount of stored energy. There are a couple of different ways to create this energy deficit. You can either restrict what you take in, or you can increase how much you use, like with exercise. Using both approaches is the best strategy because exercise lowers cancer risk too. But if you're unable to exercise because of physical limitations, take heart. Studies show you can lose weight by diet alone. There's a lot of different weight loss diets out there, and to some extent they all work because, let's face it, there's a lot of different ways to create a calorie deficit. If you cut anything into a small enough portion, you can reduce calories. But not all diets are healthy. And ultimately, health is the goal, 
and the foods we eat can immediately provide us with nutrients and benefits to protect our health even before a single pound of fat is lost. So you don't want to sacrifice nutrients when you sacrifice calories. When trying to cut back on calories, nutrient density is key because you want as many nutrients as you can get in the lowest calorie package. Your diet is a tool you can use to give your body the things it needs for good health. But before we review, I'd like to give one word of caution. If you've ever been told by a physician that you need to follow a restrictive diet for medical reasons, always follow that diet first. Taking even one day off from a prescribed diet could be deadly, even if you feel like you're making healthy choices. But for everyone else on a regular diet, don't forget to involve lots of plants, focus on whole foods, not refined, include a variety of colors and flavors, especially those from the plant kingdom, avoid burned and processed meats when possible, and don't eat more than 18 ounces of red meat per week. You also want to involve healthy sources of fats, like nuts and seeds, or olive and canola oil, and seek out omega-3 sources, such as salmon. It seems like a tall order, especially when you're also trying to restrict calories, but lucky for you, vegetables are really high in phytochemicals and really low in calories, or in other words, they're nutrient dense, and whole foods are more filling. Not only does a whole orange give you more benefits, it's also more filling than a glass of juice too. If you season with herbs and spices, you'll add more flavor and protective phytochemicals without adding calories. And the more varied your diet, the more nutritious, so boring's not even required. If you're trying to cut back on calories, enough to dip into the body's energy stores, you'll also need to pay attention to portion sizes for most things. I think an exception to this would be non-starchy vegetables. And by non-starchy, I mean things like broccoli or carrots, spinach or tomatoes, salsa, those kinds of things. One serving of vegetable is only about 20 calories, so they tend to add up slowly. But you do have to watch out what you add to them. Things like salad dressings and butters and oils, they're really high in calories because they typically contain fat and so they can add up quickly. Portion sizes are, for the most part, fruits, if they're raw, about one cup per serving or about a half of a cup if they're cooked. Grains are starchy vegetables. So by starchy vegetables, I mean things like potatoes or sweet potatoes or even beans, peas, lentils, and legumes about a half of a cup, or if it's a bread, about one slice. If something comes apart, like a hamburger bun, you count one serving for each side. With meats, eggs, poultry, and fish, a serving size would fit about the same size of the palm of your hand. Fats and oils are about one teaspoon per serving, and for dairy, one cup of milk, or six to eight ounces of a yogurt. You probably recognize this diet, though I don't think I've ever seen it on the list of best-selling diet books. But cancer experts agree. The best diet is made up of about two-thirds to three-fourths plants. And if you look closely here, that's pretty much how this plate is balanced. Of course, you'll need to apply what you already know about healthy options. For example, you wouldn't want to put a burned meat there in that protein category, but still, it's a great place to start. Are you ready for the next steps? Are you ready to see what it looks like to put this all together and make your diet nutrient dense yet calorie controlled? If so, proceed to practical applications for a healthy plate, part three in this series. In the first presentation, Nutrition Matters, we learned why weight control and diet really does matter in health and wellness. In the second, Healthy Nutrition Strategies for Weight Control, 
we learned a few basics about calorie balance, portion sizes, and what balance looks like using the plate method. This time around, in part three, we're going to see how this all comes together from a practical standpoint. So by the end of this presentation, you will see how to build a nutrient-dense plate that's calorie controlled as well. In the first step, you just take your dinner plate. If you'd like to limit calories even more, choose a smaller kind of dinner plate rather than a larger one. Or if you're having a snack, you might still want to aim for this type of balance, but of course it's going to be on a much smaller scale. Visually, divide the plate into four corners. In one corner, place a lean protein. Ideally, you might want to choose something like salmon so you get those anti-inflammatory omega-3 fatty acids. Or you could even go vegetarian. Here you might find beans, peas, lentils, or legumes. If this was your breakfast, you might find an egg right there. Preferably the kind that comes from chickens that had a diet high in omega-3 precursors such as flaxseed or free-range chickens. This, on this plate, is a boneless, skinless chicken breast. It's baked in the oven, seasoned with plenty of herbs and spices, so there's more phytochemicals and flavors. No fats or oils were used, it wasn't burned, it wasn't processed, and it hasn't been cured. Next, fill two corners, or half of your plate, with non-starchy vegetables. Here I used broccoli and roasted carrots. The broccoli was frozen at one point, right out of the freezer, into the microwave, onto my plate, and seasoned with a squeeze of lemon and a dusting of different herbs and spices. The carrots were roasted. I love roasting my vegetables in the oven. It's super easy. Just coat them with just the slightest amount of oil. Put in your favorite seasonings. In this case, I used dill. Pop them in a rather hot oven, say about 400 degrees, and roast them fairly close to the heat source so that they turn brown and caramelize. It just really brings out their flavors and made these carrots super sweet. These vegetables are going to fill me up and curb my appetite, but they're not gonna give me very many calories. In the last corner of the plate is your starchy vegetable. This could be a baked potato or a sweet potato, a piece of whole grain bread, or maybe brown rice or pasta. In this case, I chose black beans because I was looking for a different color of that plant rainbow for different sets of bioactives and phytochemicals and nutrients. I did measure this portion. This is measured at a half of a cup and then I garnished it with some yellow peppers just to throw in a little extra color. Off to the side, there was even room for dessert. So this is blackberries and mango. I've got even more colors of the rainbow there. And though I doubt I'll have room for it, I did want to show you an example of how you might also have dairy at this meal as well. So off to the side, I've got a half of a cup of yogurt. It's garnished with some strawberries and just the slightest touch of granola. And here you have it, a large meal yet reasonable in calories. I entered the foods into a nutrient database using actual portion sizes and recipes used, and it told me it contains about 600 to 650 calories. To be honest, this may be a little more than I want at my dinner meal, but it's also more than I can probably eat at one time anyway. I'll plan to have that yogurt and fruit later for a snack. And I must confess, the entree is a little larger than I had planned, but I had delegated this task to my husband and it's probably a reasonable size for him. I can cut calories back further by decreasing this to a size that's right for me. It should be about the size of the palm of my hand, not my entire hand. But as a point of contrast, let me compare another couple of meals that contain similar calories. 
How about two slices of cheese pizza from a 14-inch pie at your local pizzeria? Or a grilled chicken sandwich on white bun and a small order of fries from a fast food restaurant? And yes, I did say grilled chicken sandwich and small order of fries. We normally think we're making a good choice when we do that. Some less nutritious meals contain even double the calories as this meal. Did you know that there's a muffin out there that contains 900 calories alone? I know with this plate, I'm getting a lot of nutrients, phytochemicals, and other bioactives. And it's in a reasonable amount of calories. Because it's made up of at least two-thirds to three-fourths plants, it's a choice I know I can feel good about. See how easy it is? If you're really choosing healthy items, you'll be able to eat more foods, not less. And yes, initially, it can be difficult to cut back on energy-dense foods that we're familiar with, such as sugars and sweet treats, chips and sodas, but focus on what you'll receive in return. And it does get easier with time. We begin to crave the healthier foods when we eat them more often. And always remember that nutrition really does matter in health and wellness, and it's something you have control over. In this module, we'll be discussing behavioral strategies for achieving a healthy lifestyle. By behavioral strategies, we simply mean the actions you might take or the changes to your behaviors that you might make to achieve a healthier way of life. When looking at behavioral strategies, there's a lot of confusion as to which one is the best one for you, particularly when you think about the various diet and exercise programs that are out there. So I thought we would start by looking at what the research states and looking at what has been determined to be effective through studies that have been conducted. In this module, I'll outline six major strategies for achieving a healthy diet and promoting a healthy weight. The first strategy involves assessing your readiness for change. There's been a lot of research conducted on how people change their behaviors. Basically, we know that we move predictably through consistent stages, and understanding which stage you're in is helpful. There are five stages of change. The first stage is the pre-contemplation stage, where you're really not considering a change at this point or perhaps you may not feel able to change and possibly not even willing to make any modifications. So basically, if you're in this stage, it's unlikely that you're going to be making a change. The next stage is the contemplation stage. If you're listening to this presentation, you might be in this stage where you acknowledge that a change might be good, but you're uncertain or undecided about what to do and how to go about it. The third stage is the preparation stage. Again, if you're listening to this presentation, you might be in this stage where you're committed to doing something, or perhaps planning or doing some research, or considering how to go about it. If you're in the action stage, then you're doing something about it. You're taking steps toward change, but you're not consistent at this point. Habits haven't been formed yet. Finally, in the maintenance stage, you've reached your initial goals. Perhaps you've lost a little weight. Perhaps you've been consistently exercising, and you've been maintaining the changes you've made. When you're in this stage, you've made behavioral or lifestyle changes, and it feels good. But what if you're in one of the early stages of change, say the pre-contemplation or contemplation stage, and you want to progress to another stage? One way of doing that is to weigh the benefits and the costs or the pros and cons of staying where you are or moving forward. Some of the benefits might be improved health, increased energy, feeling and looking better, and of course, as cancer patients, we want to reduce the risk of cancer and recurrence. Some of the costs might be just the opposite. For example, perhaps it's an increased risk of cancer or other health problems, or simply not feeling good about yourself. So weighing the benefits and the costs may help you increase your motivation to move you toward change.
The second strategy involves creating healthy habits. This is a pretty interesting statistic, but it's estimated that about 40 to 45 percent of what we do each day is habit. Various studies have been done about how we actually form habits, and the research indicates that forming good habits is essential for achieving and maintaining a healthy weight in the long run. And as most of us know, making changes to our behavior takes some time and effort initially, but once it becomes habit, it's automatic. We often don't even think about it, we just do it, and that's where we want to go. So how do we make something more automatic? We can start by setting the stage and doing some preparation to establish a good foundation. And some things we can start with might be learning about healthy foods and portions, uh, maybe exploring various types of exercise. It's important to make healthy foods more accessible, so buying them and having them on hand. Gradually, you can incorporate healthy foods into your day, such as beefing up your salads with some extra carrots, broccoli, spinach, or any other types of vegetables. That's an easy change you can make. With a little preparation, you can also pack a healthy breakfast or lunch or pack healthy snacks to work. This helps keep you away from the vending machine or eating at restaurants that might not have healthy options available. So slow, gradual, but steady changes can provide a good foundation that helps move us toward creating some good habits. Create a habit of moving around more. New research findings suggest that it's not only important to exercise, say the, the typical 30 minutes a day of walking, but you need to move around continuously throughout the day. This can be done easily by simply parking a little further away or taking the stairs when possible or walking briskly. If you have a sedentary job, you can take hourly movement breaks to stretch or walk around. And even standing at your desk when making phone calls is helpful. For those of you who like a little more structure, you can try using a pedometer or activity tracker as a gauge or as a motivator to move around and walk around more often. Research shows that habits are more likely to stick if they're centered around predictable, stable routines. So if you have a fairly structured work environment, this is fertile ground for creating habits. Once you've established your habits around your work environment, then you can easily get back on track after a weekend or a vacation. Sometimes it's helpful to create a different routine for the weekends. It's also good to think about cues when creating habits. For example, if you want to incorporate breakfast into your day, arriving to work can be your cue for eating breakfast. So if your work schedule is a fairly predictable routine, you might try using it to establish an exercise program. In order to do this, we recommend choosing a form of exercise you actually like, and we talked about exploring different types of exercise when doing the preparation for establishing good habits. We also recommend you start slowly, one or two days a week, so you don't get overwhelmed. Exercise should also be convenient. For example, if you're using your work schedule to create an exercise program, you might stop to take a cardio or a yoga class on the way home, or use the buddy system at work where you might walk with a friend at lunchtime. Once the exercise becomes habit, then you can add another day, another type of exercise, or additional minutes. The third strategy involves your thought patterns. Here we'll be looking at your satisfaction about whether or not you achieve your goals, dichotomous thinking, and I'll explain what this is, your perception of the costs versus benefits, we'll consider your feelings about your body, and this involves body image and self-image, we'll talk about mindfulness, and I'll explain what this is as well, and finally, we'll look at how your own self-efficacy contributes to feeling successful. The first thought pattern we'll look at is your satisfaction, especially when it comes to achieving goals. So should you set conservative realistic goals or more high-reaching goals? Well, study results are mixed. Some studies associate realistic goals with success, others with failure, and others with no difference between them. 
But despite this confusion, we know that people who actually achieve weight loss goals are more likely to maintain weight loss. And people who don't achieve their goals but are satisfied nevertheless are also more likely to maintain weight loss. So bottom line, it's your satisfaction that's important. It's about your view and your perception. Dichotomous thinking is another factor. Dichotomous thinking is essentially black or white or all or nothing thinking. It's having a rigid view and being set in your ways. For example, individuals with this type of thinking are more likely to view failure to achieve, say, weight loss goals, for example, as complete failure. These individuals also consider weight loss achieved as inadequate or unsatisfactory. So it's important to be flexible and accepting of yourself and your accomplishments and challenges. Now we've talked about weighing the cost versus benefits to help you move toward change. With regard to thought patterns, we'll consider your perception of the cost versus benefits. For example, the benefits of weight loss might include things like looking and feeling better, the ability to wear better fitting clothes, compliments from friends, and feelings of control or success. However, if you feel these costs or the effort to achieve these results outweigh the benefits, say you're in the gym two or three hours a day, this may not be realistic for you and you may have to rethink your strategy. So it's important to make your strategies work for you. Your feelings about your body can make a difference in terms of your success. So it's important to develop a good relationship with your body. Studies indicate that individuals who can maintain a healthy weight have a more positive body image than those who are unable to maintain their weight. These individuals are sometimes referred to as regainers because they fluctuate between periods of weight gain and weight loss. Regainers are also preoccupied with weight, size, shape, and sometimes base their self-worth on their appearance. So watch out for negative feelings about your appearance and take a less judgmental approach. If this is an area where you think you might need some help, we have counseling support services available for you. Mindfulness involves paying attention to what you're doing or what is happening in the moment. It's about being present. First, learn to trust your body's signals about fullness and hunger. Pay attention to hunger cues and be aware of eating according to a set of guidelines or strategies. Mindfulness also involves eating more slowly and savoring the sight, smell, taste, and texture of food. It involves using all your senses and enjoying your meal. This helps you feel satisfied sooner. And pay attention to triggers. These may involve stressful situations or emotional triggers that make you plow through a bag of chips or grab that tub of ice cream or something along those lines. When this happens, don't judge yourself and simply redirect, returning to your guidelines and strategies. Research indicates that stress can be a factor in triggering overeating, ultimately leading to weight gain and unhealthy behaviors such as not taking the time for rest or exercise. So self-care is very important. We recommend trying meditation, yoga, massage, hot baths, whatever helps you decompress. And as you know, stress happens, so it's important to learn how to manage your reaction to stress. If you need some assistance with stress reduction, our counseling support services can help. Studies indicate that people who feel more capable are more capable and people who are more capable feel more capable. When applied to weight and nutritional management, you can actually start feeling more capable as you begin to see improvement, say feeling better, looking better, maybe wearing a smaller size, etc. And this further increases your motivation to keep going. We recommend short-term goals that can put you on a positive course toward feeling more capable.
The sixth strategy involves integrating the strategies or methods that make sense for you and your personality and that fit your lifestyle. But say you want a basic roadmap that you can follow without much thought. Well, we've integrated some of the strategies that we felt were helpful, and we've developed six tips that might work for you. The first tip involves daily physical activity, which is a must for developing a healthy lifestyle. Even if you create an exercise program centered on your work schedule like we discussed, add fun activities on the weekend that don't seem like exercise but that you enjoy. For example, being active with your kids or taking family walks or maybe dancing. And remember to look for opportunities to move around and simply keep moving. Exercise is one of the strongest predictors of long-term success. Second, eat lower calorie, less fatty foods. In other words, simply add more fruits and vegetables to your day and gradually eat fewer meats, rich foods, or processed foods. Jennifer explains the types of foods that are beneficial in her modules. Third, most of us have heard it's important to eat a healthy breakfast. It's thought that eating breakfast kickstarts your metabolism. It also keeps you from getting really hungry so you're not absolutely starving and out of control by lunchtime. In addition, when you're hungry, stress hormones are released, so eating breakfast may have some emotional benefits as well. Fourth, monitor your weight, exercise, and nutrition using some moderation or a moderate approach. There are two schools of thought here. One is where nutritionists recommend a lifestyle approach where there is little or no emphasis placed on weight loss goals or tracking methods. The other involves a more structured approach with all kinds of monitoring methods. And the one you choose will probably depend on your personality, but if you need some guidance, we recommend a blending of the two approaches. So make friends with the scale and use it as a gauge, not as a measure of success or failure and also eat and exercise based on a set of guidelines. This is helpful and it will keep you on track. Tip number five involves maintaining a consistent eating pattern. This means avoiding erratic eating such as periods of not eating or periods of continuous grazing. And finally, catch slips early and be conscious of returning to your healthy habits when you break them. And notice I said when instead of if because it will happen and it's okay and you simply go back to your habits that you've established. So just to review, the behavioral strategies we've discussed involve assessing your readiness for change knowing which stage you're in, and weighing the costs and benefits to move you closer to making a change. We discussed creating various healthy habits and how to use a stable, predictable routine to help you do this. We discussed your thought patterns, such as your satisfaction with your accomplishments, or your perception, or how mindfulness helps you become more aware of what you're doing. Reducing stress is also beneficial for overall good health and it plays a part in overeating and weight gain. Promoting self-efficacy. The more capable you feel, the more capable you are and vice versa. And finally, we suggest using an integrated personal approach where you incorporate the strategies that work for you, your personality and your lifestyle. And if you want a simple program without much thought, you can try our roadmap. In this module, we'll be discussing emotional eating. We'll discuss what it is, what triggers it, and we'll offer some suggestions for dealing with it if you think you have this issue. So what is emotional eating? Emotional eating involves eating for reasons other than hunger. And we all engage in some type of emotional eating at some point. And emotional eating is not always bad. In fact, even when we're enjoying our meal, it can be considered an emotional experience. However, if eating or overeating becomes the main strategy for dealing with feelings, emotions, or filling a void, it may be a problem. So there are several things to consider when we're addressing emotional eating. 
First, let's consider stress and emotional triggers. Acute stress can cause a loss of appetite initially, and this is that fight or flight response that we often hear about. Chronic stress, or more long-term stress, can cause an increase in appetite, and this is where we may see some episodes of emotional eating. Emotional triggers may also include things like depression, anxiety, guilt or shame, anger or frustration, insecurity, loneliness, grief or sadness, or perhaps unresolved issues. So we sometimes use food to soothe, distract, numb, or reward ourselves. Another thing to consider is your family of origin, and this is the family in which you grew up. Research shows that the behaviors of our parents influence our current eating behaviors, our body image, which is tied to our self-esteem, and also our relationship with food. So perhaps things like a critical or a judgmental family environment may be contributing to the emotional eating, or parental expectations and pressures, perhaps not feeling that you can meet those, or parents' attitudes about food and their own weight. So overeating may have developed as a strategy for dealing with feelings that developed during childhood. Another consideration is body image. Body image is the picture you have about your physical appearance in your mind. It can include both positive and negative feelings, and it can be influenced by society, family, culture, and life experiences. And body image influences what and how you eat. It basically influences how you feel about yourself. Body image and self-esteem are connected because the way you feel about your body can affect the way you feel about yourself as a whole. Finally, consider your cancer experience. We find that people's eating behaviors typically change after cancer. So it may be that your weight may have changed since your diagnosis and treatment. Your eating behaviors may have also changed. So we see sometimes people eat more now that they can taste food and enjoy food. Sometimes we see that people are seeking comfort foods and so here we may see some emotional eating. Sometimes we see that people are more concerned about health and wellness and, and that's the good part of it. Your feelings or your views about your body may have also changed. So it's important to pause and maybe consider what is different for you since cancer. So if you think you have an emotional eating issue, a typical weight loss or weight management program is probably not the right approach for you. We have some suggestions and we believe the first thing you should do is talk with a counselor and seek support for the emotional eating or any other type of eating disorder. It's important to focus on emotional wellness and healing. And we emphasize making healthy lifestyle changes instead of focusing on weight monitoring, counting calories, and dieting behaviors. It's important to keep things simple, making small changes that are easily attainable and that don't overwhelm you. And we don't really want to make anything a struggle. Also, it's important to be kind to yourself. Accept yourself as you are now. Find ways to reduce stress. Reducing stress is good for overall wellness. And try to be mindful or engage in intuitive eating. So when you do eat, slow down, note internal cues, and savor your meal. However, this may be difficult initially if your satiety meter is broken. So again, talk with a nutritionist or counselor so that you can establish a more structured approach if needed. And once you heal emotionally, you can begin to incorporate the strategies suggested in the Behavioral Strategies module. So of course, the next question is, what do I do now? Let's define up to three easily measured objectives. These could include weight loss, but might also include such things as nutritional choices, or avoiding certain dietary habits. We then like you to start journaling your diet and you can either do this through a numerous 
online applications, or if you're more comfortable using a handwritten log, simply do that. Then call your nutritionist to review your goals and to establish a plan for contact, which will usually be on a monthly basis, and accountability. Most of all, let's commit to doing this. This is a wonderful step towards a more healthy you. Thank you for participating in this plan and I wish you the very best of success.